Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for bearing with us in those two minutes of technical challenges. My name is Natalie Joy Cannell, and I'm the client uh, and uh, client support and administration manager here at Enriched Academy. Had to double check what my title was for a second there. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I literally just got off the French version of this webinar. Uh, I'm psyched. I'm excited. <laughs> I enjoy talking about credit. I, it's 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 a passion of mine. It may seem like a strange passion of mine, but it is in fact a passion of mine. I'm going to share my screen with you so that you can see what I will be presenting. So I am taking over from my colleague, Heather. She was supposed to present today, but unfortunately has been pulled away. And so her loss, my gain, as far as I'm concerned. So I'm excited to be here with you. Just to confirm that all of you can hear me, could you please use the raise your hand button to, uh, you know, to make me know that you are there? Oh, delightful. Yay, yay, yay. Fabulous. Awesome. Love it. Okay. So you can hear me. You can see me. Wonderful. Now, uh, before we begin, I am just going to go over uh, a couple of little things. First of all, I'm bringing up our disclaimer up here. Just wanted to make sure that you are aware that, um, you know, all this information is for educational purposes only and that you have access, in fact, to an amazing resource uh, called PSISIP who can help you navigate all of these interesting financial challenges. And in fact, I believe, let's see, who do we have on today? We have Martin who's available today. Is anybody else from PSISIP here today? It is my thing. Hi. Hello again. <laughs> Hi. Nice to see you. So yes, Martin is here listening in. Uh, he probably knows more about all this than I do. So if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the question box. We will try to answer them as we go. Or at the end, if you have any questions, uh, uh, you know, we'll do that. Is it possible to increase the volume? Are you not hearing me loudly enough? Let me see if I can adjust my settings. I will adjust my microphone. Actually, my microphone's pretty loud right now, so maybe uh, an issue with. Sorry about that, Trevor. Yeah. Alrighty. Um, those of you who have hands up, you can put your hands down unless you have something very specific you need to confirm with me. The other thing I wanted to mention is that we have a Q&A box. So that is the box. Uh, the chat function isn't currently open to everyone, but I will uh, pop a question here and say, uh, you post your questions here. So this is where. This is where you will be adding in any of the questions you have throughout the course of the webinar, okay? The chat is is useful, sure, but the, the questions really help us see, you know, and for Martin and I to be able to really decide and see what's going on there. So, throw that in there whenever you have a chance. Now, you've seen the disclaimer, that's fabulous, but before we really go into the whole credit presentation, I just wanted to give you a quick overview of CISA because, we're super excited to be partnering with CISA. It is actually really an honor for us. Um, we are very fortunate to partner with all kinds of first responders across the country. And when we got the opportunity to work with CISA, knowing that we would be helping members of the Canadian Armed Forces, it was a it was a no brainer for us. Uh, we really try to make financial freedom accessible to everyone, and CISA has a very similar mission of really wanting to make sure that you have support for your financial health. And it's like, it's an incredible mission and we think it's really cool that you have access to this. It's particularly interesting because, I mean, there are financial advisors are everywhere uh, that you, I mean, I won't say there are a dime a dozen, but there are a lot that exist all around the world. But what's interesting about CISA is that they really understand your military lifestyle. They know what it's like to be deployed. They know what it's like to have to move from one city to another. They know the unique intricacies of how to budget for different cities and different, uh, you know, lifestyles, different circumstances. They know you. They 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 they've lived through what you've lived to a certain degree, so they're a really really great resource to go to, and they really cover everything. Now, generally, CISIP is often known for insurance. The thing is, CISIP also manages life insurance, uh, you know, travel insurance, uh, medical insurance, things like that, financial planning, saving and investing, financial education and counseling. Like it's the entire package, and they're all over the country. Like as you can see, dot 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 from one coast to the other, there should be a CISA uh, organization, a network 
of people that can help you. So I'll give you contact information for CISIP at the end of the presentation so you can schedule some time to talk with somebody if you would like more information. Uh, even just their website has a plethora of resources, so it may be worth checking out. All right, let's jump into mastering credit. And what are we gonna learn today? I have so much to tell you today, so bear with me here. But we're gonna talk about good debt versus bad debt. We're gonna talk about credit scores. We're gonna talk about credit card statements, which can be a foreign language for some credit card strategies, credit dangers to avoid, and then of course we're going to do an open Q&A at the end. So I'm just going to look at my question box before we begin to see if anybody uh, has any questions before I start. No, sounds good. All right, well buckle in because I have a lot to tell you. So good debt versus bad debt. Now, generally speaking, a lot of people uh, immediately when they think of debt, they think of it as a negative thing. Here's the thing, that's actually not realistically what happens. Uh, there are things that you can buy that are considered good debt because they grow in value or they create an income for you. What we consider bad debt is something that loses value and that doesn't create an income for you, right? So if you're looking at this in a visual way, good debt appreciates, meaning it gains money. Bad debt depreciates, meaning it loses you money or doesn't make you any money. So examples of this, good debt, going to school, investment properties, education, seminars, books, a new home, uh, investment properties. These are all things that are either bringing things back to you from a monetary value, like from a monetary perspective and bringing you value, or they're bringing you value as well from like a personal perspective and a career perspective. If like you're investing in your education, which is going to allow you to pursue a new career venture that may have a different you know, financial bracket or salary bracket, that's considered good debt. Bad debt is stuff that depreciates. So things that don't bring you money, don't give you anything. Credit cards, entertainment, clothing, restaurants, new cars. Now, okay, I'm gonna pause for a second and take a sip because I wanna make clear, these things are things we still want, <laughs> okay? And also clothing, mm, generally considered a need for most people. But the point is, these things don't necessarily grow in value. Um, you know, you may want to buy the nicest, uh, most fashionable handbag, thinking that it will be worth more five years from now. That may not necessarily be the case. Uh, you know, antique furniture, it might increase in value, it might not, right? There's all kinds of things that we may have urges to buy that we sort of think that will gain value, that will increase in value, but the reality is a lot of the time they don't. So it's just about being aware of when you're spending the money on those types of debts and knowing that it may not bring you the value back you think. Now, 76% of millionaires don't drive brand new cars. <laughs> and there's there's actually a story that uh, Kevin Cochran, our co-founder, uh, tells about the fact that like one time he met somebody and he was like, oh, you know, like, why, why, why is this the case? If I was a millionaire, I'd have this new car and that new car and started listing off all these cars, which I could, I don't know, if I, I don't know cars. So I don't know the names of them, but I'm sure they're all beautiful and brand new and shiny and go fast, fast. But the point is, then Kevin said to that person, yeah, that's why you're not a millionaire. Because if you do have millions of dollars, you are being careful about how you spend it and where you're spending that money. And what is one of the richest men of the world drive? You may not recognize this person. He's Warren Buffett. If you don't recognize him, he's one of the richest men in the world. He's one of the most successful investors of all time. And what does he drive? Well, he doesn't drive like an ugly, not beat up a car. No. He's driving a Buick. It's a nice car. So he bought one in 2001 worth 32, when he was worth 32.3 billion. But then he drove it for five years and then got one in 2006 and then drove that one until 2014, right? So it's not just about buying something that's used. It's also keeping what you have and using it for as long as you possibly can. Here's an example of like how things are, relatively speaking, right now. I totally recognize that new car and used car prices, the, the, like the range between them is getting smaller and smaller. Sometimes it's almost cheaper to buy a new car. But if you're doing your research, you will probably be able to find a used car that is more affordable. So for example, this Dodge Ram uh, 2023, brand new, 84,000. This 2022 model, 
with only, was that about 12,000, 13,000 kilometers on it? 58.9. It's a big difference. That's like, uh, oh, wow, I did, can't do math right in my head right now. Uh, yeah, you know, like that's uh, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot of a difference. I think it's about $25,000 of difference. And if you're uh, thinking, well, I don't like buying used because they don't come with a full warranty. In fact, a lot of them do now. Uh, not all used car companies are not providing warranties. In fact, a lot of them are offering warranties that are comparable to what you would get with a new car. But what I can also say is that even if it doesn't come with the full warranty that you're really expecting, the chances of you putting $25,000 of repairs into this car in the next five years, pretty low, right? So you'd still be saving money if you bought used. Um, and does it not have the used car smell? No, the fresh new car smell, pardon me. No, it doesn't. It doesn't have the. Our co founder told us why he has the same beat up truck for years and years and years, and it's because he has kids. And he said, it doesn't matter which car he has, his car smells like, you know, teenage sweat and goldfish crackers, right? Like that's what it smells like. And I'm sure if you have families, you agree, it's just going to get full of garbage anyway. So, Get the like new car smell from the gas station that you hang on your, uh, you know, uh, rear view mirror and save yourself the money. Uh, that costs like three bucks. And then you're saving $25,000 by getting a new car or a used car. Pardon me. It's definitely worth it. Here's the number, like the actual factual numbers, too, that are a bit like shocking to me is that the average car depreciation is like 18 to 28 percent within the first year. And then within five years, it's 50 to 70%. As soon as you drive off the lot, your car depreciates in value. And so it's not really an investment. Are cars important for your family, for you know, getting to and from work, from, you know, especially if you live in more rural areas, it is important to have a vehicle. But what type of vehicle? You know, what at what cost? So it's important to take a look at that. Same thing for furniture. Sometimes we think we're buying a piece of furniture and it's going to appreciate in value. No, not so much. It, it drops right away. Here's, here's another example that I absolutely adore. So let's say you have $5,000 and want to buy a TV. Buying a brand new TV, five grand. Within five years, that HD TV is worth zero. And on top of which, when you think about it, chances are, uh, it, you know, if someone were to try to buy that, a five-year-old TV, they would scoff at it because there's been 15 newer models since then. Because we live in a consumer world where they keep releasing new models and new things and we really want them. But if you were to take that 5,000 and invest it in an index fund, in this case, it's based on the S&P 500 at about an 8% rate, over five years, that 5,000 would grow into almost $12,000. So here's why it's important, right? If you're saving a certain amount of money, you can then put that towards investments, towards different savings that is making you money. Now, I'm not saying don't go out and buy TV. You know, that may be something that's important to you and, and, and something that is important to your family, then do it. But just be aware that how much you're paying could be, uh, you know, you're not going to get that money back, essentially. You're never going to be able to sell that TV two, three years down the road and make the money back that you paid for it. So just be aware of that. Next up, credit. Now, I know we've been talking about credit in general, but here we're going to go into credit cards and credit scores. Now, I really feel like this is one of those situations where no matter what age you are, there's something you can learn about this. And also, like, we don't teach this to younger people. When you're 18 or 19 and you, you know, you go to university and they give you a credit card because somebody was on campus and signed you up for one, and they don't give you a handbook on how to manage it at all. And that's tricky uh, because there are a lot of pitfalls to using credit cards, but there are a lot of great advantages of using credit cards if you can use it to your advantage. And as you can see, the credit card business is booming. We're at 23 billion credit cards now compared to none in 1957. So it's a big business. And it's important to be aware of how that business is run so you can use it to your advantage. But 64% of Canadians have checked their credit score in the past year. Now, that's a decent number. It has increased since the pandemic, but we want to encourage you to make that number even higher. And how you can do that is going to the two main uh organizations and candidates that help you with this, TransUnion and Equifax. 
Now they will give you what your credit score is. Now a credit score is very similar to like uh, a grade in school, right? The higher it is, the better your grade, right? So if you're less than 550, it's kind of like having an F, but then if you're over 740, in fact, I think it's over 833 now, if I'm correct, these numbers change based on the union and whatnot. But I think over 833, you've got an excellent credit score. So that's pretty interesting. Why is it interesting? Because it means that when you know what your credit score is, you have a better understanding of how creditors and loan people see you and what you may have access to moving forward in your life. And that can mean the difference between being able to have a new house, being able to buy a used car, and not. So what influences your credit score? Now, there is a very complex set of calculations that I'm not gonna do here because one, we don't have those full calculations. They're kind of proprietary. But two, it, it, I, I don't wanna do the calculations right now. I'll just show you the percentages. It's much, I can show you a graph, it's much prettier. So 35% payment history. The biggest chunk of keeping your credit score healthy is paying 100% of your balance on time 100% of the time. That's really the key. You want to make sure that you're paying your balance on time by the deadline and 100% of it. If you can't pay 100% of it, you're at least making the minimum payment by the deadline. Super important. The next thing is the amount owed. Now, this may seem a little strange, but the idea is. Creditors want to see that you can responsibly manage the credit you have. So let's say you have a big chunk of credit and you're using up the big chunk of credit. That indicates to them that like you're in need of credit. You need credit to live, which may make them less keen on giving you more of it. But if you have a credit utilization rate of 35% and lower, and I'll kind of explain those numbers in a bit, it means that you're trustworthy, that you have credit, but you're not using it all. So lo like, borrow like loaners, loaners you know, are more keen on giving you additional credit because of that. 15% length of credit history. I'm sure all of us, or maybe not all of us, but a lot of us have that like one credit card that we got, you know, 10 years ago. And we're like, oh, like, I don't really use that. I mean, I maybe use it once a year to pay off something, but I pay off my bill at the end of the month and I might as well just cancel it. Mm, not so fast. You may want to consider keeping it. If it is with your consultations with your financials advisors and the counselors over at CISA, if it makes sense to keep it, it could be a good thing because showing that you have a lengthy credit history, there's a long time of you being responsible and taking care of your credit properly, that's to your advantage. Next is new credit card applications. If you're just checking your own credit score, that's not going to affect anything. But if you apply for six different credit cards and all six of those institutions are doing a hard pull on your credit account or on your credit history to see what your credit is like, that's a negative for you because it makes it seem like, well, essentially you're desperate to have as much credit as possible. So you may be trying to shop around for, you know, the best interest rate, but applying to multiple credit vehicles all at once can have a negative impact on your score. And lastly, the type of credit use. What creditors and like people like to see is that you're able to manage different types. So mortgage, car loan, credit card, line of credit, because each one of those different vehicles of loans have different terms, different uh, expectations. So if you're able to use more than one type of credit and are using them responsibly, it really shows them just how much they can trust you with their loan. So those are like what influences the credit scores. Now, we also get other questions about specifics. So here are some specifics you might be wondering. Mortgages, credit cards, student loans, yes, affects your credit score. Rent payment, no doesn't affect your credit score. Any utility and cell phone bills, it can if it goes to collections. So again, those like if you miss one or two things happen, generally won't affect your credit score. But if you're missing things frequently enough that they have to submit that information to a collections institute, institute organization, it can affect your credit score. Insurance payments, no. Bank overdrafts, again, yes, if it goes to collections. Parking tickets, Yes, if it goes to collections. Now, we like 
everybody gets a ticket here or there. But if you're paying it responsibly, it's not going to affect your credit score. If you avoid paying it and it goes to collections, that's when it's a problem. Child support and alimony, same thing. If it goes to collections, it can affect your score. Checking your own credit, nope, you're good. Age and income, nope, doesn't matter. Your score doesn't care about that. And credit counseling, no. This is very important. This is why going to see a credit counselor, it's so good. Like it is so helpful because they can help you really understand what's going on and make a plan. Now, if that plan does involve debt consolidation, working with collections, things like that, then yes, that can affect your credit score. But don't ever be afraid of going to see somebody for help. I mean, we go to a doctor if we have, you know, an injury, we go see a mental health professional if we are struggling with our mental health. Going to see a professional for our financial health should be demystified, should not be taboo. It should just be something that we should do and feel comfortable doing. And I highly encourage you to do so. All right. The true cost of damaged credit. This is what it can look like if your credit uh, score is poor. Okay. Here are some examples of interest rates. If you have excellent credit, you could get a mortgage at 2.5%. Okay, maybe not in this economy right this second, but the idea being is that 2.5% versus 15%, a little bit different. Car loan, 3.9, poor, 20.9. Excellent rate, 2.9, subprime, 19.8, right? The, the issue is the lower your credit score, the less your chances are of being able to get an interest rate that will be helpful and convenient for you. Same with renting a condo or a home or cell phones, right? The better your interest rate, you won't have issues for approvals. The, the better your interest rate, better your credit score, you won't have issues. If your credit score is damaged, you may have more difficulties getting access to those things. Another quick thing of note is bankruptcy. Now, if you file bankruptcy the first time, this appears on your credit report for six to seven years after the date of discharge. That's a lot. Now, caveat to that is sometimes when you're working with a financial advisor or counselor, you will notice and you will learn that declaring bankruptcy could in fact be the healthiest financial decision for you. And if you've done your research and are working with the right counselors, you may discover that that is the correct path. And if that's what you need to do, then that could be what helps you move forward with your finances in a healthy way. But and we want to do our due diligence to let you know, though, that when that does happen, your credit score can still be affected for like six to seven years afterwards. It's not quite a, like a clean slate. So just be aware of that. If you need to declare bankruptcy and it makes sense for you and your family, then talk to a counselor to see if that works best for you. Let's give you a concrete example of what this could look like. So let's uh, let's say this guy, um, what's his name? His name's Ben. Ben has been going to university for a while, He, but he graduated just about two and a half years ago. Now he has one credit card and he was always making the payments on time for five years, five years consistently. But at some point he lost his job. And for three months, he didn't make payments. He just, no minimums, nothing. Well, within that three months, his credit score dropped to 521. Within six months, it could drop to 363. The challenge is that like you can make just some small mistakes in a short amount of time, and it can have a huge impact on your credit score. Now, the good news is these small things that you do correctly or right can also have a big cumulative effect for your credit score. So we're going to show you some things in this presentation that will help you advance that for sure. All right. Yeah, that that's it's so quick. It's so quick. And and here's an like kind of an interesting example of this too. Let's say this person, Ben, um wanted to get a car loan. Well, with his good credit, he would get 6.3% interest with a bad credit score 20.9. This is crazy to me too because he would be paying more in interest than the value of the car with a poor interest, or a poor credit score definitely worth keeping an eye on, right? And the lost opportunity, this is essentially a way of us showing that like what you are paying in interest, if you didn't make that purchase and invested it, 
eight years or five, 8% at five years, you're making a good chunk of change, right? So you really want to make sure that you are making the right decisions to put money where it makes sense for you. Same thing with a mortgage, right? You know, bad credit, you're paying $950,000 in interest on a $400,000 home. That's not ideal. It's really not ideal. So I'm going to advance these so that you can all see them and take a photo if you wish. So here's a summary of those ways to build an excellent credit score. So we've already covered them and I'm going to give you a quick summary. So number 10, attract, attract, no, attack unattractive debt first. Now, there are kind of two ways of going about this. You could either try to lower the debt that has the highest interest rate first. Some credit counselors will recommend that you lower your biggest debt first. Uh, each situation is different, so that's why we recommend you talk to a credit counselor or somebody at CISIP who can really advise you based on your unique set of circumstances. But the point is, you want to really attack something specifically to get it down as low as possible as quickly as you can before attacking everything else. Maintain at least two credit vehicles. Like I said, credit card, mortgage, car loan, line of credit. It shows that you are flexible, it shows you're responsible. It shows that you can manage multiple things. Keep longer term credit vehicles open. If you can keep those credit cards open, the balance is at zero, you're barely using them for a long period of time, that's great for your score. Aim to use 35% or less of available credit, and I'm also gonna do six here, ask for the highest available credit limits. Now, that may seem counterintuitive. Like, I, I'm worried I'm going to spend too much. I don't want to have a high credit limit. If you can be responsible, it is actually very good for your score to have a high credit limit. So if you imagine you've got $10,000 of credit available, you don't want to be spending more than $3,500 of that credit. Because when creditors look at you, they see that you have a low credit utilization rate. And to them, that's positive because they see, look at all this credit they have that they're not using. They must be responsible with their finances. We don't mind giving them another loan for a car, a home, et cetera. So if you have a high credit utilization rate, like, you know, let's say 100%, you have 10 grand of debt and you're spending 10 grand all the time, it shows them that you can't manage it. You don't have the means to manage it. So sometimes it's helpful to ask for a high credit limit because then it will make that distance between how much credit you have and how much you know credit you've spent bigger and it will lower your credit utilization rate. So that's very good for your score. And always read the fine print. I'm going to harp on this a lot in a few in a few slides, so I'm just going to skip it for now. Then last four, avoid rate shopping. So it's like I said, you want to be careful that you're not applying for multiple credit vehicles all in a short period of time to get the best rate. It has a negative effect on your score. You want to monitor your score for any errors because when you're looking at your score, you can also look at uh, your general credit history. So if there are any loans there that don't apply to you or if there's, you know, God forbid, some sort of identity theft, you can notice that and fix it right away. And here are the two most important. You must pay the full amount owing every month when it is owed and you have to make 100% of your payments on time. Those are really like the two golden rules to follow. Now, if you can't pay the full amount owing, we always say pay the absolute minimum. But I'm going to show you in a little bit why that's uh, particularly challenging. Oh, OK, so quick question before we move on, because I'm also going to check the credit box. Uh, raise your hand if you have checked your credit card in the last year or check your credit score in the last year. Pardon me. I want to see. That's pretty good. That's very good. Well done. Okay. Very good. Yeah, it's it's super important. <laughs> I love Trevor's. Smear glue around. You have the new car smell automatically. It's so true. I'm also noticing there's a question, so I'm going to take a look in here right now. When buying new, be the smarter choice for you to increase rates on used vehicles being 9%. Yeah, so this is that's the thing. You do have to take a look because some used cars, they're not offering great interest rates for the uh, for your purchase plans, right? But that's also when you can take a look to like, is it worth buying a used car with 
a line of credit. Maybe your personal line of credit has a lower interest rate and maybe you can buy that used car with your line of credit and pay it off in certain installments that you pre-plan for yourself with that lower rate. So that's why the market right now, you're right, Michelle, is tricky. The interest rates are quite high on used cars right now, but that's why you have to kind of take a look and see what makes the most sense. Uh, but yeah, you're correct. Sometimes you're better off just buying used. Okay. How to read a credit card statement. Now, 30% of Canadians carry a credit card balance from month to month. That's a lot. Um, and the national average credit card interest rate is 16.73. That is so much. But here's the other thing. Did you know that credit card debt is compounded daily? Now, because often we're taking a look at our interest rates online, we see APR, right? Annual percentage rate. Which is important to know, right? Like that, that is important, but I'm gonna show you a little bit how that number is actually calculated in a daily component. Now, in your credit cards, you may see different types of interest rates. So you wanna check your statements carefully because the APR is for purchases in this case, right? Standard purchases. 22.97 uh, in this case is for cash advances. So if you're using your card to take cash out, it's not a debit card, unfortunately. You're not taking money out of your own account. You're taking money out of somebody else's account, and you're going to be paying a higher interest rate for that. 0 0.97 here is the promotional balance for uh, the promotional interest rate for a balance transfer. Balance transfers can be very helpful and very useful. I'll explain a little bit more about those in a little bit. I told you this presentation was full of information, but the point is, often those rates are quite low, sometimes even zero. And I'll show you why that's useful in a bit. And this will show you how many days your purchases are interest free. Sometimes there is a grace period where there is no interest that you're accruing. It can be useful. This is actually a screenshot of one of our co-founders credit card statements. And this is often what you'll see. You'll see cash advances, you'll see purchases, and you'll see fees. Don't we love fees? But the point is it will show you the annual interest rate and then the daily interest rate. So how that 19.997 is actually calculated daily. So from the moment you make a purchase, it's being calculated. Now, here's an example of Kevin Cochran's, our co-founder's credit card statement. You will notice multiple pizza pizza purchases. We do not judge him, but we do tease him a little bit for and he allows us to, uh, which is uh, immensely pleasurable to me. I enjoy it. Uh, he's, he's a lot of fun to tease. So what you always want to check is new balance. Now, you notice in this case, it's kind of at the bottom. Kind of frustrating, isn't it? You'd think it would be right at the top. In some cases, it is right at the top. But in this case, it's near the bottom. You have to go looking for it. This is the, the balance you ideally want to pay in full at the end of each month, OK? You will see your interest rates, your regular purchases and your cash advances, and you will see the minimum payment. Now, if you can't pay that full balance, please pay the minimum payment by the deadline, okay? And it will give you a date that you have to pay it by. Super, super important. Now, that daily interest, let me show you how that works. So on a $10,000 credit card balance, 19.99 interest is actually done based on 0 0.0547 daily. So what you're actually paying is $5.47 a day in interest. So 164.41 for the month. Now, what's a little strange is that every credit card company calculates this a little differently. It is not arbitrary. They do actually have a calculation. But if you want to know what that is, you have to look at the fine print. I'll be talking about fine print a lot in the last little bit, but here it shows you in the statement, if you look at the payment section, it will show you how they calculate it. In this case, it's 2.2% of the statement balance. It will vary from credit card to credit card, but find your balance, find the statement balance percentage, and it will show you how much that calculated that minimum payment. So that can help. The other thing to consider about this is that I mean, this is going to sound kind of obvious, but like if you have a, a loan, a vehicle of credit that has a lower interest rate, then you are going to be paying a lower daily charge, right? So in this case, the credit card versus the line of credit. Sometimes you are able to get a line of credit 
that is at a lower interest rate than what you could get from a credit card. Sometimes you could get a home equity line of credit for the same in the same way. People have a tendency to think that credit cards are the only way they can only vehicle they can use to go about making purchases. There are other ways of doing it. I recommend talking to CISIP to give you uh, advice on which vehicles of credit you may have access to. But like a difference between 164.41 of interest paid a month versus 65.10, but you know, that's not bad. I would like to save $99 a month in interest if I can. So here's the next question I'm going to ask. Raise your hand if you look at your credit card statement every month. I wanna see lots of hands. But if I don't, I won't judge because there was a long time or I didn't look at my credit card statement every month. It's not, okay, that's actually not bad. We are looking at, all right, we're looking at just about a third, about a third of you. Okay, that's good. The two thirds that aren't, I recommend you do. Uh, I recommend you look at them at least once a month. There's kind of a couple of reasons for it. Um, one, there's nothing like really paying attention to exactly what you're spending to make you feel more aware each time you make subsequent purchases. So if you know exactly where your money's going and how you're spending it, you just generally become more aware and you make generally better purchase decisions moving forward. But the other thing is about making sure that you catch errors. If there was an issue in the actual charge, if somebody has act like stolen your identity and you weren't aware, you need to catch those things quickly. So that's why we highly recommend you check your credit card statement every month. Now, moving on to some credit card strategies. Not all cards are created equal. And here are a few things to look for to see if maybe a a particular card is useful to you. Now, we're not advertising any specific credit cards. There are a ton of them. But because they're all competing for your business, some of them offer certain things that others don't. And here's what you can look for. Do they have a sign-up bonus? There are so many point cards. So many point cards for trips, for products, for gas, for groceries, for movies, for travel, for air, airplanes, for car rentals. Like, it, it goes on and on. Really take a look at what those are to see if something is actually beneficial for you and your lifestyle. But you want to be careful to make sure that you're using a card that doesn't have an annual fee. Because here's part of the challenge, right? Like, let's say you sign up for a card that gives you points for a trip. Delightful. If you travel a lot and the amount of points you get allows you to save $5,000 on a trip, well, maybe paying the $100 annual fee is not something you are overly concerned about. But if you're not really getting great value from your points and you're paying an annual fee, it may not be financially worth it to you to get a card with an annual fee. You'd be better off getting a card that doesn't have an annual fee that will bring you points that will be to your advantage. Second thing is travel insurance. Now, more than half of Canadians are traveling without travel insurance. And we say nay to that. We want to fix that because, okay, we are blessed in Canada. Our health system isn't perfect, but a lot of the time we don't necessarily correlate health care to having to spend money. We're fortunate in that sense. But as soon as you travel outside of the country, you may need to pay out of pocket for certain things. So here are some examples, you know, stitches up to almost $4,000 for stitches. That's that's not a potentially not a life or death injury there, but that's or that, that may be more than the cost of the trip itself, right? So it is actually really advantageous for you to make sure that anytime you're leaving the country, you have travel insurance. And you may want to check within the credit cards you already have to see if they have a travel insurance package already available or that you can activate a travel insurance package through that card. Nobody likes paying insurance, okay? Like, let's be honest. And I, I, I know CISIP deals in a lot of insurance and I'm not mocking them because they provide excellent service. But I'm going to confirm, nobody likes paying for that, but it's so important. In fact, insurance, depending on your personal lifestyle and your family circumstances, can be an integral part of your whole financial plan, and especially if you're traveling. Paying a small fee to ensure that you're protected when you leave the country and won't have to pay thousands of dollars should something happen, Yes, you don't have to like paying that small fee, but let me tell you, you will be happy you did if you have to then all of a sudden spend thousands of dollars on hospital bills in another country. It's worth it. 
And overall insurance, once you've kind of done an assessment of, you know, who you are, your family, your needs, and your financial plan with somebody at CISA, it can be really helpful to maintain that goal that you have. 0% credit card interest. Yes, that exists. It sometimes very much exists and often exists as a balance transfer. So if you have a credit card that has a high interest rate, let's say 19.99 on $20,000, you're paying $4,000 in annual interest. That's a lot. But if you are able to get a credit card that has a lower interest rate with a 0% balance transfer bonus, then let's say for those six months, or whatever the months are according to the term, you're not paying interest on that. This is an excellent tool to use if it is a short-term tool. This is not a long-term solution because you can't keep just transferring your balance to many, many, many cards. The balance is just gonna keep increasing. The interest rates are not gonna keep reducing. Essentially, it's not part of a long-term plan. It is excellent as part of a short-time solution, short-time strategy. So. Definitely something to take a look at. Foreign currency conversion fees. This is really interesting to me because generally when we travel, we always encourage, well, banks usually encourage us to always have some form of like physical you know, currency, like paper money of some sort from the country that we're traveling to. But the rates for conversions and the fees associated to them can vary based on which financial institution you're getting the, doing the transaction with. I'm not saying having cash isn't important, but you may be able to actually make some of your purchases in that foreign country, in their foreign currency, at a reduced rate with no fees or with lesser fees, right? So check, definitely check your credit cards because sometimes it may be higher fees. The whole point is you really want to double check to see what you have available because it could actually be beneficial to you in the long run. You may save money by paying with a credit card in a foreign country than paying in just cash, having done the exchange at home. That's an option. And also sometimes you don't wanna be carrying thousands of dollars in cash in your pocket. Extended warranties. This is also an excellent tool. Some credit cards will provide a warranty if things get lost or stolen or damaged, provided you purchase the item with that credit card. So this is something, again, read the fine print, take a look at the fine print. If they have extended warranties like this, this is an excellent tool. Because if something happens to that particular purchase and you're not able to resolve it at, through a warranty with who you bought it from, you may have a built-in warranty within the credit card. Next is strategic cash back. Love this. Some credit cards give one to 3% cash back. Amazing particularly suits well for this particular image because I feel like something like a gas purchase is something that we do regularly and it can cost a lot of money. So if you know, okay, I'm always going to put my, put my gas purchases on this credit card. I'm paying off the balance every month and on time, and I'm always getting one to 3% back at the end of the year. That That's a good option. It's an excellent option. Might be something you prefer over points. Another thing that a lot of people don't know about is that secured credit cards exist. They're similar to like a debit card in the sense that like you put money into an account and that's the money you have to play with, but they act like a credit card so you can use them anywhere a credit card is used. This is excellent for people who either don't have any credit history, you know, uh, new immigrants, new people to the country who don't have a Canadian credit history, or if you already have like a poor credit history and your credit like is score, score is low, this is an excellent way to help improve your credit score. Now, these cards can have higher interest rates. There sometimes are fees. Again, read the fine print. But if you want to improve your credit score and you're struggling to figure out how to do that, this could be an excellent option. Did you know that in some places you can pay rent and your taxes on your credit card? very cool. Sometimes those are big chunks of change and sometimes you don't have that money right away to do it. So credit card pan can be a great tool if you're paying it in full and on time at the end of the month. You're going to you're going to be able to do this presentation for me by the end. You need to be able to pay it all off at the end of the month in full. But it can be an excellent tool to help, you know, give you a few extra days to make sure that you have the cash in hand at the right time in the right place. Excellent option. 
buying gift cards. Now, this may seem like a strange one, but you bear with me. When you have a card that has points, let's say you're uh, there's an Amazon points card. I don't know if that exists, but we'll just pretend. You have an Amazon points card, and then you use your Amazon points to buy an Amazon gift card, which then means you're getting cash back from Amazon, essentially, right? Like There are ways of essentially stacking things to create a more cumulative effect. Something to look into. And then read the fine print. I know I've said it a lot, but I'm going to give you a very clear example as to why. Sometimes there are offers for furniture, electronics, things like that, where it's like pay nothing for 15 months. Now, what you see here on the screen is actually from uh, our co-founder, Kevin. I think he bought, for, this is from a furniture store, and this is directly the fine print from that contract where he did one of these deals. There are all kinds of services that offer them, and, and they can be great. If you're not paying interest or anything on the balance for 15 months, that's fabulous. Except if you get to the 16th month and you haven't paid anything, you're going to have to take a look at the interest. So here we have a conversion fee of 42.50, a special interest charge of 29.9%, administration fee of 99.95, annual membership fee of 35. Like there are all kinds of hidden fees in here that can be devastating if you don't actually follow the loan protocols here. So what we recommend is if you get a deal like this, let's say it's $3,000. You've bought some beautiful furniture for $3,000. You don't have to pay for 15 months. No interest. Delightful. Well, you better put aside for the next 14 months, one fourteenth of that $3,000 each month. So that when you near the end of the 14 month and your 15 months free is ending, you already have that money. You pay it off in full. It's done. It's essentially a way of you essentially saving the money yourself instead of having to pay it off all at once. But don't wait till the end to all of a sudden go, oh, I need to pay this $3,000. I don't have it. Not ideal. You want to use the system to your advantage and start putting aside the money on a monthly basis, so you never have to deal with any of those extra fees once you go past the loan term. Super important. Okay, you still have 10 minutes. Couple of credit dangers to avoid before we get into the last, uh, the essentially some extra stuff I wanna share with you. Now, expensive loans. Now I already told you that different loan vehicles have different um, credit rates, or not credit rate, interest rates. Thank you. Now, payday loans. You may be shocked to see that that's at 546%, which seems just, I, like it unfathomable to me. But these payday loans exist. In fact, there are a ton of companies all over the country that you know are, are trying to get people to take these payday loans. The cost to borrow $1,000 for two weeks in this case is $210. You want to avoid these types of loans as much as possible because it's just it's so hard to to stay on top of them. At 546% interest, that's, that's it's incredible, right? That's, no, you don't want to be doing that. Work with your financial advisor, counselors over at CISIP to see what other options you have so that you can keep your interest rates low in whatever, you know, credit vehicle you choose. Be careful of guarding your financial information. Now, there's been a huge amount of growth of cybercrime in the last, you know, 20 years. It's impressive. Uh, people are getting better and better at it. So we just want to give you a couple of tips of things to watch out for. So phishing is generally when people send you an email or a message, can by email or text, and are trying to get you to click on something um, to like scam you out of money. What you want to do in this particular case is really take a look at, um, you know, like the two ways of identifying this. Well, there's many ways, but here are the two key ones I want to show you. Well, you will hover your cursor over the email address itself. So make sure you see what the email address is. Now, if it's from FedEx and it's truly from FedEx, it should have a FedEx related email, like support at FedEx.com or something of the sort, right? It'll have something like that. Then you can also verify online to make sure that email is legit. But chances are it'll be some sort of random thing. And then, you know, mm, probably not from FedEx. You'll also want to hover your cursor over any links. Don't click on them, but hover your cursor over them. Some of you may not know this, but when you hover your cursor over a clickable link, the address should appear on screen. 
And that's when you're going to double check the address to see if it's actually taking you to where you think it's taking you. Those are two ways that they can track you. So don't click on anything, just report them as spam and delete them. And that's the best way to go about it. Malware or malicious software is any software developed that they can steal your data from you. So there are different ways that they go about this, but if you look in the don'ts category here, this is how you can really prevent that. Don't share your passwords with anyone. In fact, try to use like a, like a bank, a password vault tool of some sort if you can. Online banking, you really want to avoid doing that on a public network. Public networks on public Wi-Fi's are just not as secure as your home Wi-Fi network. Uh, so you really want to be careful about doing any banking on those networks because it's much easier to steal your contact information and your financial information that way. And never share your banking information with anyone. Banks and credit card companies and CISIP will never call you and ask you to give them your banking information. That's not how banks work. There are like security protocols for that purpose. So if somebody calls and says, oh, I'm from CISIP, I just wanna confirm your date of birth before I give you like, just say, no, thank you, hang up. And then you go to the CISIP website and you call their number and verify this. In fact, it may, if, it may even be helpful to report these things to the organizations that people are mimicking. Don't ever give your banking information with anyone like that if they approach you. If you are calling their official numbers and, and whatnot, then they may ask for your information for verification purposes. But some random person who calls you and says they're from your bank, I wouldn't trust it. I would hang up and go through the official channels. So what are you going to do after this presentation? You are going to check your credit score regularly and monitor it monthly, ideally. If you do it every two months, that's not bad too, but regularly. You're gonna now take a really close look at your credit card statements and you're going to check it each month. And each month you're paying your full balance on time. Number three, you're reading the fine print and you're really making sure that you fully understand all of the benefits. I know that was a lot of information. It's, it's a lot for me to share, but over here, and I'm opening the question section just so that I have a good look at it. We have a few minutes before we finish. On the left, um, from experience, yes, Trevor, from experience, visiting a foreign hospital is very costly. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it costs a lot of money. So if you are able to get certain levels of uh, medical insurance that way, it is very, very helpful. Uh, on your screen right now, is two QR codes. The first one on the left is how to sign up for our Enriched Academy portal. In your partnership, in our partnership with CISIP, you have free access to our education portal, which provides way more than just information on credit scores. It's like a finance 101. We're in our pilot program right now. We're super excited to be working on it. We can't wait for you to see it. So sign up. It will provide you free access to this educational course. On the right is the QR code to contact CISIP directly. Then you can work with a counselor there. You can essentially really figure out what will work best for you financially. The other thing I will do is I will add my email in the question. Oh, actually the chat box is open. That's unusual, but I will add it in there. I'll add it in the chat. Support at enrichedacademy.com. So if for whatever reason, those QR codes aren't working for you or for whatever reason you just want to check in with me to see and ask any questions based on what has gone on today, I can answer them for you. Or I can direct you to the correct system person who can answer them for you. Also, system's website in general has a wealth of information on different financial elements, so also check that out. What do you recommend for credit score check? Equifax, TransUnion, or someone else? Equifax and TransUnion are pretty equal with regards to how they provide credit scores. Uh, what I will say, and I don't know if Martin can speak to this, but what I have noticed is that they are also a business, right? So there is no really direct cost to verifying your credit score, but there can be costs associated to year-long memberships to like track your identity, have certain things reported if there are errors. Is that correct, Martin? Would you agree with that? 
Yeah, most of them try to charge a fee because, again, as you said, they're a business. I typically recommend creditkarma.ca or borrowwell.com. Uh, those are free, basically, because yes. we see ad advertising, but we see advertising everywhere we go in this day and age. Mm -hmm. And it is free. It's legit. It's directly from both credit file. And they put it in a fashion that's easier for people to read. Because the ones from Equifax and TransUnion, if you're not used to reading credit bureaus, can be a little bit tricky. It, so it, yes, a little intimidating. I I do actually I use Credit Karma. What I do like about Credit Karma too is that you can really specify how many emails you get, just like a lot of organizations. But I get the regular monthly reminder to check, so I find that very useful. So then I am checking, and yeah, their their interface is quite clean and neat. Uh, but there are advertisements, so you do have to be aware of that. Um, let's see. Do we have a podcast? We do not have, actually. That's an interesting question, Trevor. Uh, apparently you haven't grown sick of my voice yet, which I appreciate. Um, we don't have a podcast, but it's actually something we're looking at developing and I'll actually put it in our feedback as something that, uh, you know, could be useful when we do more with the system. Um, and let's see, are there any other questions that have been stated? I'm not seeing any other questions. If you have any other questions, please feel free to throw them in the question box right now or in the chat box. If there are no other questions, that is totally fine. We have two QR codes up on screen for you. One to be able to access your educational resources through Enriched Academy. One to chat with uh, CISIP directly. Um, we see some hands up. I don't know if I am able to unmic. Trevor, did you have a question? I can probably unmute you. Uh, here you go. Trevor, you are unmuted or you're you're allowed to unmute. Do you have a question for us? No. Not seeing. Okay. And Adriana, you still have your hand up. Do you have a question? Um, I'm sorry, it's Trevor. Hi, Trevor. Go right ahead. Um, I had a line of credit a while back, and um, the bank said that I wasn't paying down my balance fast enough. So then they doubled my interest interest rate. Hmm which was weird. I'm like, now my my balance is like way more, so I can't get done the principal. Martin? Uh, I can answer that question mm -hmm. coming from the banking world previously, uh, which really is counterintuitive, but banks will do this where okay. it's called uh, they do risk evaluation on all their customers so there's probably something that might have brought your credit score down uh and because the balance wasn't moving you became right. riskier and their answer is to increase the interest rate which really right. doesn't help at all <laughs> but it is it is something that that can happen for sure it helps um, the bank i'm sure my, yeah. my suggestion is give us a call we can kind of have a look at things to see if there's something that might help you deal with that okay thank you adriana you had your hand up i've i've allowed you to unmute do you have a question for us I did just notice a question uh, in the chat oh, as well. Uh, mm -hmm. They were asking uh, some bank apps give you credit score based on your information and if those are safe. So again, that is, you know, it, it's it, it's hard to say in the sense of your credit score between both credit bureaus is going to be different because they both yeah. calculate it differently. And most banks also overlay their own information based on the type of customers they like to lend to. So it's normal that your credit scores will vary from one place to the next. It's a good indicator. And the score is exactly that's an indicator. Uh, so yes, it's a valid score for that institution anyway. The other ones on Equifax and TransUnion should normally be in the same range, give or take maybe 10, 20 points. I agree. I tend to Amber notice Lidl TransUnion seems to be more generous with their scores than Equifax. Interesting. <laughs> huh. <laughs> Fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm not seeing anything else popping up. I think we are at our time. You will also receive a link to the recording of this in an email, uh, I think by the end of the day, if not by tomorrow. So if you need to review any of the information, uh, listen to me say, read the fine print, 
five times more, you can. Uh, you have the two QR codes there. Worst case scenario, if those don't work, please email me at support at enrichedacademy.com and I'd be happy to help you. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. I'm going to go have lunch now. Have a great day. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining us.